We're back with another episode of Dixie Dems. It's the podcast from Lean to the Left that takes an irreverent look at politics in the South as, as well as nationwide. So stay with us. Welcome to Lean to the Left, home of no holds barred commentary, plus interviews with fascinating people, some of them top experts, others simply with interesting stories to tell. You'll never know who will show up at Lean to the Left. Now here's your host, Bob Gaddy. Hey guys, welcome to the Lean to the Left podcast in the May 2023 episode of the Dixie Dems with my partners Arthur Hill from North Carolina and Robert Thompson from Georgia. Arthur is first vice chair of the Brunswick County, North Carolina Democratic Party, and Robert is based in Atlanta, and he founded Peach News Now and its opinion podcast, Goddamn Liberals. That's G-O-T, damn liberals. Me, I'm based in South Carolina, a state with the distinction of having two Republican candidates willing to take on Donald Trump in the Republican presidential sweepstakes. They, of course, are former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, who was U.N. ambassador for Trump, and Senator Tim Scott, the only African-American GOP U.S. senator. So today we'll take a look at what's going on politically in our three states as well as around the country. Arthur, tell us what's going on in North Carolina. Tell us about your big promotion that you got. Well, uh, yeah, we just had our county convention and I was promoted from uh, communications chair to first vice chair. And as far as I can tell, there's really not much difference. Uh, and there's <laughs> definitely no increase in salary. <laughs> Uh, All righty, then. I'm uh, I'm just trying to help out and uh, and uh, try to get some, some blue office holders in this very red county. We'll, and we're going to keep struggling until we get there. Okay, how about you, Robert? What's happening? So between jobs and uh, got a new one here, but I'm um, hanging in. I was not out of work very long, which was a good thing, but um, I'm still able to join you guys and and talk about this. So the one that I do want to talk about here in Georgia, there is a, a case of a mother and I'll use the term lightly that apparently she drowned her child in a, and this is a, if you know where Sandy Springs, Georgia is, it's North of Metro Atlanta. This is a pretty populated area. I would say it's a pretty decent part of town and you've got some footage of everything that I've read that she led the child into this pond and now the child is dead. You know, it's so unfortunate. It's really sad. I cannot help but think all of, we've talked about it on our episodes over and over again, these abortion laws. This was clearly, and of course, innocent until proven guilty, but this is a lot of damning evidence. Yeah. Did this mother even have access to an abortion? Was she swayed? to not abort her child at some point. There's so many different angles, and I'm not trying to put you know, words in anybody's mouth. We don't know the full story yet, but it's not good that you've got a party that is ruling from a minority making these decisions about women's health care, and then you see the potential of these really bad outcomes from that. So follow that. Uh, it's not going to be resolved anytime soon, but it's something that really has been talked about here in Metro Atlanta for sure. In other words, are you saying that that this woman killed her child because she was unable to get an abortion? I'm making that as a possibility. We don't know for sure. I see. The child was not born recently. From everything that I've read, the child was able to walk, so it's at least a couple of years old. But it's just a horrible story all the way around. And you wonder, and, and if you really go out and do news searches about unfit mothers like this, and there's certainly in any other stories like this across our nation, number one, were they fit to be a mother? Were they even ever given an option? Were they adoption? There's just so many different angles, and it's so complicated for some, you know, white Republican person to pass these laws against women's health care like that. 
we'll see. Stay tuned on, on what's going to happen there. Yeah. This whole business of abortion, restrictive abortion laws across the country is really bad. And that's what's going on here in South Carolina, too, which I'll get to in a little bit. It's terrible. It's the top of the news up here. We've got a situation in North Carolina where uh, one woman switched parties from Democrat to Republican, and uh, now the uh, Republican uh, woman legislator, and now the uh, Republican Party and the state legislator has a veto-proof majority. So they almost immediately passed a a new abortion bill that uh, reduces from 20 to 12 weeks uh, the time it takes to get an abortion and uh, puts in a, a bunch of extremely restrictive provisions about how and when and under what conditions a woman can receive an abortion in North Carolina. And uh, one woman who is uh, started the session of, the, of this year's legislature as a Democrat switched. And whereas she had introduced legislation, which would basically uh, make the original Roe decision of the law in North Carolina, as soon as she became a Republican, she voted for the Republican bill. So it's hard to imagine where she's coming down on this. But there's a, a huge struggle going on now between the governor and the legislator. It comes down to four Republicans that they're focusing on to, to try to get them to switch votes. Or in one case, there's a Republican legislature from the Wilmington area, one of the House districts in the Wilmington area, who actually took a walk during the original vote, did not vote on the bill originally. And uh, and as a matter of fact, said during his campaign that he wanted to keep the bill as is. I don't think he's going to be able to take a walk again. It'll be amazing if he does. He might. But all the Democrats need to sustain the veto is one Republican to defect. So that could very easily be the guy. Governor vetoed the bill last Saturday, and so the bill should come up in the House or the Senate for an, for a sustain or override sometime later this week or early next. So that's at the top of everybody's headlines this week in North Carolina. We're fighting abortions here, too, in South Carolina. The Republicans continue to try to virtually outlaw abortions in the state. Last week, Governor Henry McMaster called the state legislature, which had just adjourned. He called them back into special session to work on a bill that would ban most abortions as early as six weeks as well as to deal with some other legislation that was still hanging around that hadn't been passed, the least of which was the budget, (laughs) the least of which. Anyway, lawmakers had barely gotten home after the General Assembly adjourned. On May 11, they had to jump back in their cars five days later, go back to Columbia to consider this abortion bill. Um, So why didn't they do this while they were there? I'm getting to that. Let me, thank, let me tell you the story. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Okay, just hang in there. Be patient. I will tell you. <laughs> what happened was that the state has, the state Senate has five female senators. Three of them are Republicans and two of them are Democrats. And combined, they got together and led the opposition against this bill. And it was a Republican senator by the name of Sandy Sen who likened the implications of the bill to the dystopian novel, The Handmaid's Tale, in which women are treated as property of the state. Sen said the effort was simply a power grab by men. She said, quote, in the Senate, the males have all the control, close quote. It's really true because it's the men who also control the state Supreme Court. And the reason they control the state Supreme Court is because the state legislature picks the judges, the justices. And the only female justice, Kay Hearn, 
has just recently retired. So what did they do, the state legislature? <laughs> they got another guy in there to replace him. So the South Carolina Supreme Court is the only state Supreme Court that does not have a woman on its bench. So the impact of that on any potential abortion issue that comes before it remains to be seen. But I'm surprised they didn't call up that guy in jail. What's the yeah. attorney over there? Murdoch? Why didn't they call yeah, him Murdoch. out? He's not doing right. anything. No, he's not doing anything. He's got a lot of time in his hands. Yeah. I mean, time is about all he's got in his hands these days. I don't know. I haven't been up to the prison to see him, to see what he's doing. You have Zoom calls these days. He can be a Supreme Court justice from jail. Why not? Oh, sure he could. There's no reason why he couldn't. Absolutely. Trump wants to be president from jail, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can be president from jail, why can't you be a Supreme Court justice from jail? I don't yeah. see what the problem is, do you? Murdo ought to have to get his license to practice back, but probably the Supreme Court would give it to him. They probably would. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, sure, he's sure. a great guy. I'm sure. Yeah. He only killed his wife and kid. No, that's, that's all. Yeah. That's all. At least he was convicted of killing his wife and kid. So I guess yep. we can say that he killed his wife and kid yep. without worrying about being sued. What else you got going on there, Robert? So the other case or story here in Georgia. Mr. Stephen Owens. So I came across his Twitter feed while the Georgia Assembly was in session, and I forget the exact name of the organization, but he basically works for an organization. That they lobby the uh, elected officials here in Georgia to be better stewards of our tax funds and to take a look at, for example, school voucher bills, take a look at, for example, Atlanta and Georgia has become the new Hollywood, but that's because of all these tax credits. And so when I met him at the time, again, he was really focusing on these school vouchers and he enlightened me. And there's a whole episode, if anybody wants to check it out, that he, we did about a month or two ago. And his name is Stephen Owens. And you did that on your podcast? Yeah. On Goddamn Liberals. Yeah. He, he was another uh, uh, guest on that, that episode. Right. And so he was really focusing and honing in and he let me know, and I wasn't, I didn't know about this here in Georgia, there were existing laws on the books that you could take public school funding and divert it over to private schools. And then they were, they were not calling it a voucher, but there were other ways. There were also tax incentives to parents that chose to take their children out of public schools. His efforts and others were successful. There was a more extreme school voucher bill that died in the legislative process here in Georgia, but you better believe it's going to come up again. But I have to give Mr. Owens credit. He did a really good job of breaking this down. Now you've got um, allegedly Texas is looking at the types of tax credits that Georgia gives away to the movie industry to do filming projects here in Georgia, that whole, you know, made in Georgia, all that with the peach on the, on the, the reel and all the tax credits behind that. And Stephen, you know, pretty much just fact checks them over and over again of it's hugely expensive. It's not efficient. There was one study that said for every job that the movie production industry and television production industry does here in Georgia, it costs Georgia about $40,000. Now, $40,000 is actually a little more than minimum wage, but is that a good investment for the, a state like Georgia to be giving away all these tax breaks and literally every job created costs about $40,000? I mean, I'll ask you guys, should new jobs cost $40,000 in tax credits? Most of the business that Georgia got came after the legislature in North Carolina stopped underwriting movie productions in our state. And as soon as the legislature did that, the movie industry pretty much dried up, much of which came out of Wilmington and New Hanover County, just north of us, and they all moved to Georgia. Uh -huh. And then the legislature thought better about it, and they reinstalled some of the 
credits that they had taken away. But that's an interesting, I've never heard anybody say that North Carolina actually loses money anytime a show is produced. So I don't know if there's any difference between what we do up here and what you all do down there in terms of uh, tax credits and, and uh, other kinds of incentives. But I know that the, the production business is more or less coming back in this state. It's not up to the level it was before, but uh, uh, mostly because a lot of folks are staying in Georgia. A lot of people actually physically moved down to Georgia after the incentives ended here, and they don't seem to be, all of them at least, don't seem to be coming back. So I guess they like it down there in the Peach State. Possibly. And I should have actually wore, I, I, um, have you ever heard the term clutch my pearls? Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. So I actually I play a good bit of poker with a number of friends of mine. I actually have a pearl necklace downstairs. I should have wore for this episode. But there is a show that I discovered recently. It's on stars. It's called P Valley. Mm. And I'll let you decide on what P Valley stands for. But it is a yeah. it, it's set in Mississippi in a a black strip club in a small rural town in Mississippi. And again, the show is called P Valley. The show is very NC-17 rated, but that whole show was produced pretty much here in Georgia. And you have Republican, alleged, conservative, Christian value Republican legislators that allow these huge tax incentives for such, again, I'll try to clutch my pearls here, that you know that there are some very racy scenes in this TV show. They're up to season three now, and they're, and guess what's blocking them right now is the writer's strike. Yeah. So P Valley season three is one of the shows right now that is on hiatus until I and I wrote my state legislators and they're both blue. I live in Blue DeKalb County, but I said honestly, y'all need to take another look at this. Do you really want again those good Southern conservative Christian tax breaks going to fund? A pretty racy TV show. So when you send your letter like that to your state legislators, do you hear back from them? Do they pay any attention to you? Sometimes I, I do need to reach back out. I would assume in this case they would probably agree. But in all the big lobbyists, there's this one dude in this blue county and he's making this one point. It's also complicated. So I know that a lot of people... You know, I, it took me a couple of minutes here to describe what's going on, and people were still probably looking at me like, what are you talking about? Right. So it's complicated, I get it, but versus what Arthur was saying in North Carolina, a lot of these states have capped these tax cuts and tax mm -hmm. breaks because they saw how expensive they were for the state. Georgia has not done that, and that's why it's just floodgates wide open of whatever they choose to produce here. Okay, go ahead, uh, Arthur. Well, I was going to say, that's a really interesting development. As I said before, I've never heard anybody up here make that claim, and it's probably because of the might be be because of the caps on the benefits, but uh, on the incentives. But uh, I'll have to look into that and see because that's a big deal in in our part of the world and our part of the state. Wilmington is the headquarters for all the video production that takes place in the state, and uh, even the Republican legislators that. Uh, represent this part of the state, have supported that industry in southeastern North Carolina. So there must be some real differences between what we're doing here and, and what's going on down there and, and what they're doing. It's unlimited, is that what I understand. Someone explained it to me about a year or two ago. When the accountants have a movie or TV production, there is, I assume, because it can't all be assumed at once, for example, stars, you pay for stars as a TV you know, network monthly. So there's going to be some projected 10, 15 year income for that particular project. What the Georgia tax credit allows them to do is they can take, I assume that estimated amount of Georgia tax that's going to be paid over five to 10 years and they can immediately turn it around for a percentage. So they can sell that tax credit for say 80 to 85% of what that value is to another person that has to pay Georgia taxes, the cash immediately. 
and there's no limit on this. I understand that this similar type of structure in other states has been capped because again, guess what? It's expensive. And if you just let it just run amok, obviously there's going to be room for losses. So, hey, I I don't want to stand on my soapbox and say that stop them all, but I think there are ways to limit this because it's truly expensive. And you have in Georgia, as of later this year, they are now going to start taxing TV and media downloads. So if you go to iTunes, if you go to do an ebook and things like this, those traditionally have not been subject to Georgia sales tax. But now Republicans, the party of lower taxation, they're, oh, we need to tax that. So you're going to start paying sales tax on your ebooks. But again, the movie industry and all them, they continue to get those tax breaks. Yes, they got good lobbyists. Would you say, Arthur? I guess they have good lobbyists. <laughs> I guess so. Huh. Uh, all right. Have you got anything else that you want to talk about, Robert? Stay tuned this summer. We are going to look for what uh, Miss Fonny Willis is doing in Fulton County. Uh, you have folks that are cooperating with her office. We've seen this before, right? This is typically how prosecutors and the FBI do things. Uh, Miss Fonny Willis is who? She's the Fulton County District Attorney okay. that has been investigating that stupid phone call that that former president made to find thousands of votes. Okay. And uh, we'll see what happens this summer. She has also prepared local law enforcement saying, be, oh, be aware this summer there's going to be some indictments. I'm not going to tell you when, but you need to have, you need to be ready. That's already in the works. So why would they need to be ready? What would they need to be ready for? Hopefully, a lot of those followers of that former president are still in jail. So hopefully, uh-huh. it's going to diminish a lot of, but there's going to be some public discourse and a lot of unhappy Republicans about this. Public discourse. You mean there might be some violence? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. But again, thankfully, you know, a lot of the Trump followers, they are in jail and not able to participate. Yeah. Explain, some, explain something to me. Am I correct? In my understanding of the justice system in, in, in Georgia, everything, she's already been through one grand jury, right? And is she on her second one now? And if so, how come? There have been, there was a special grand jury, then there was another grand jury. There's been a lot of stuff going on. And I'm not a legal expert, but there have been several. Why, and, can't, they, why can't they do it all in one grand jury? Do it all at once. Unfortunately, I'm not a lawyer. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, maybe we need to get a lawyer on our show. <laughs> I got a buddy that would be a good one, but I don't know. He's in Michigan. That's hardly the South. <laughs> <laughs> Is southern, maybe he's Southern Michigan. <laughs> but what they did in Michigan is they tried to duck the governor up there before. So <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Now I'm talking about Mark Bellow, who is he's a attorney, legal thriller author, and he contributes to my Lean to the Left blog site, which, by the way, you guys, if you haven't seen it, it's leantotheleft.net. Anyway, Mark contributes articles to that, and he also is co-host of the Justice Counts podcast, which I also co-host with him. He's really sharp and a good guy, but like I said, he's hardly a a member of the Dixie crowd. (laughs) Of course, we're not either. Uh, truth be told. I'll just transplant it down here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're all transplants. Actually, Robert, you're not a transplant, are you? From South Georgia. From South Georgia. Okay. All right. I'm one of those uh, city slickers in Atlanta now. So yeah, okay. I'm a transplant from Maryland and before that, Pennsylvania. I'm a transplant from Maryland, too. But part of the time was spent in Southern Maryland. Does that count? <laughs> there you go. Actually, I lived in a county in Maryland where they still have a Ku Klux Klan yeah. group, whatever it's called. What do they call those Ku Klux Klan groups? A bunch of good people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. On the other side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we need a actual, that was sarcasm, just making sure that people were aware. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, you got anything else you want to talk about there, either of you guys? Because I got something else to weigh in on. Go, go right ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. All right. Well, you guys were 
Robert, you were talking a little while ago. You've been talking, you guys have been talking about the movie industry, which is the entertainment industry. Here in, in South Carolina, especially in Myrtle Beach, there's the entertainment industry is pretty a pretty important industry, but it's not necessarily a movie making industry. We have a lot of of really high class gentlemen's clubs, strip joints. Do they some get tax them, credits too? Some of them are less high class than others. Do they get tax credits too? I don't know if they get tax credits or not, but I will tell you that they are pretty popular among the tourists hmm. and among uh, a lot of the local yokels, some of whom may or may not be politicians. Hmm. Now, it's one thing if they're a strip club which caters to heterosexual guys, basically, looking to oogle half-naked women. That's what you do. It's a different thing, though, when it's not a strip joint, but rather is a bar that shows drag shows. Now, here, the state legislature, not having anything else that's important to do, is considering legislation that regulates drag shows. I'm clutching my pearls again. I was clutching his pearls again. <laughs> Some guy has introduced a bill called the Defense of Children's Innocence Act. It would prevent, it would prohibit children from attending a drag show that's considered explicit. Now, I don't know. I've never been to a drag show, although I have to say that way back when, my son, who came out as being gay, actually performed drag shows in Baltimore for a while. <laughs> That's my only experience with a drag show. I never went to one of them, <laughs> although he used to dress up to look like Jackie, who is my wife now. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was rich. So, so anyway, anyway, to be serious, <laughs> to be serious now, Jackie's in the audience and she's chuckling. <laughs> and by the way, you guys that are seeing this um, on YouTube, you see the palm tree behind me? I'm really not sitting on the beach. You can figure <laughs> that out, right? Okay. Anyhow. You're closer to the beach than I am now. Yeah. yeah. So anyhow, this, this. Uh, Defense of Children's Innocence Act deems any business that holds a drag show to be a sexually oriented business. Now, I presume that sexually oriented businesses are in for various special regulatory requirements. I don't know for a fact. But the bill says a drag show is intended to provide sexual stimulation or sexual gratification. So, so that's prompted. So how's that any different from a strip club? Oh, well, that is my point. That's and, the point. And, I'm and never mind that former president that wore all that makeup and went and dragged for four years or longer. <laughs> yeah. I certainly got no sexual gratification out of that bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. All right. So anyhow, this guy, his name is Joe Dabrowski. Joe is the owner of this bar on, on Polly's Island, which is just south of Myrtle Beach. It's called Local Eat, Drink, Celebrate. That's the name of his bar. He said lawmakers are creating legislation about topics they know nothing about. <laughs> and my question is, what's new about that, right? That so they can anyway, copy and paste and submit, though. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, he said their drag shows are restricted to customers over 18 and are held in a room in the back of the restaurant. He said all of their queens go upstairs, change into their costumes, and then they come down and they do their thing in this room that's that's in the back of the restaurant. So he said, some people complained that these drag queens would be out 
parading around in the little shops that are outside near this bar. But he said, no, that would never happen. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't go out and do that and make a spectacle of themselves. So anyway, the state legislature has tried to pass this bill, or at least they're considering this bill. We'll see what happens to it. But I understand that's not just that's, it, it's not just happening here in South Carolina. There's a lot of states that are passing legislation restricting drag show performances. And, and I guess maybe it's that copy and paste outfit that you guys were talking about in previous that's episodes, right? Yeah. yeah, that's one of them anyway. I don't know if that's the one responsible for this bill. But yeah, Alec. Yeah. yeah. Tennessee, you've got Dolly Parton up there. And Dolly Parton is an American treasure, but she can sure look like a lot of number of drag queens. She was asked a joke one time. She goes, Dolly, how long does it take you to do your hair? And she goes, I don't know. I'm never there when they do it. <laughs> no, what? She said, what? Oh, so they asked Dolly, they said, how, how long does it take to do your hair? She goes, I don't know. I'm never there when they do it. <laughs> it took me a beat or two to figure out why yeah, that me too. was. Me too. <laughs> Dolly is an American treasure. And oh, yeah, she is. Absolutely. She, she tries to stay out of politics, but I think she's pretty clear where she <laughs> lies with all this. And you, know, you go against Dolly, you're going against Lord. She's quite religious, so. You're going against the Lord if you go against Dolly Parton. That's yeah. funny. That's funny. That is funny. Okay. But, but to Bob's point, I I don't know about this bill. I don't even know how this bill could stand any kind of judicial scrutiny. Probably couldn't. Once again, we need that lawyer on this show. Yeah, we do. <laughs> how can you put up that kind of restriction against a place that does one kind of show and not do it on another place that some people have moral objections to that, that uh, does another kind of show. Uh, exactly. And which is a lot more, I would say pointed, that's not the word I'm looking for graphic in, in its, in its uh, sexual orientation, right? It can be. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I look at you go to a strip club what happens at a strip club? They take off their clothes, they strip, and they dance around, they climb up on poles, they flip their boobs at you. They'll come and sit on your table in front of you and flip their boobs in your face and all that kind of stuff. And if you pay extra money, you can take them to this special room where they will do more aggressive things for you for an extra fee. And that doesn't happen. At it doesn't happen to drag shows. No, it doesn't happen. Uh, to not drag the ones shows. I've ever been to. No. <laughs> not the ones you've ever been to. Look at the. First of all, these are guys, and they're dressed up like women. So, where's the sexual aspect of that? I don't. And, and a lot of times, they're pretty talented. Yeah. yeah, I know my son Mike was. He was really good. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, anyhow, anyhow. So speaking along this as well, and there's a connection with the new show. If you remember the old show, Matlock had Andy Griffith in it. Yeah. Back from the so now they're going to reboot that, and guess what? They're going to gender bend it, and Kathy Bates is going to play Matlock's character. Is that right? Yeah. But don't tell those Republicans because you know <laughs> that they could find some issues with that. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, are they going to produce it in Georgia? Quite <laughs> likely, but. Mm -hmm. They got that writer strike. They got a, you know, true. Arthur. You might be a part of that art, art, art writer yeah. strike now too, right? Yeah. Drag shows are centuries old. We're not talking about something that's just popped up here with a counterculture. We're talking about we're talking about 16th century Shakespeare when women couldn't act and men had to perform in women's roles, and none of this is new. And and it's just it's as though the it's as though the Republicans have all of a sudden have discovered that this is going on and this is horrible and we've got to stop it. How can you stop something that's been going on a locomotive for 500 years? It's a good thing that we have somebody who is so well-educated and, and up-to-date on their history. It's really <laughs> good. <laughs> Thanks for adding that well, it, little bit well, of insight to our I just show. had a 
We need to go back and look up these names and addresses of these folks that have submitted these bills. Maybe they need to get some pearl necklaces in the mail. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, that's a great I, idea. That's I, a great idea to set, start setting fake pearl necklaces around. <laughs> okay, I want to ask yeah. you guys. I want to get. I want to move on from from drag shows and strip shows to something a little bit more serious. Do you guys think that um, Trump is going to be indicted or convicted? But he's already been found guilty of abusing this writer, E. Jean Carroll, in an apartment store dressing room back in the 90s. And he's going to have to cough up several million dollars. Five million bucks. Yeah, for his trouble which he says he didn't do. But anyway, do you think that his legal issues, that and all of these other legal issues, what's going on in Georgia and with the and in New York and with the Jack Smith investigation, do you think that uh, that's going to cost them the nomination in the end? Yes. And I think I said it on the episode or two back. I think Trump is not going to make it to jail. Yeah, yeah, you, you get, said you know, that. Jail you th- time. Yeah, you think he's going to end? He'll be dead before that. He's ancient. He's. Yeah. I don't see him making it there. But Republicans go right ahead because he did not win the popular vote the first time. He lost the second time, and he's going to lose even worse this time. You've got people jumping ship everywhere, and Republicans they cannot say it because it'll be held against them, but they know this. And he is literally the biggest boat anchor on the Republican ship they've ever seen. I want to talk about a CBS News YouGov poll that was just published. Shows that Trump has a 30-point margin over Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And there are some pretty revealing additional findings. For one, even though election deniers cost the GOP dearly in the 2022 election, this poll shows that a large majority of Republican-leaning voters continue to believe the 2020 presidential election was stolen from Trump. And they want to vote for candidates who agree with that position. That's a big percentage. That's a big margin. And that's pretty troubling, don't you think? Yeah. If what Robert is saying is is that Trump isn't going to be the next president of the United States because he's going to die before he reaches office, that's one thing. But if he doesn't, I think he is. I don't think he's going to be the next president of the United States, but I think he is going to be the Republican nominee. And only because he has such still to this day. And and it has a, has powerful sway, and there's nothing on the horizon, including indictments from Fulton County and and from the Justice Department that that are going to stand in the way of that. I, it's it's quite possible that he could be under indictment and uh, and get the nomination from the Republican Party next year. I think that's entirely possible. I do too. And another thing this poll showed was that 75% of Republican leaners say Trump's supposed 2020 victory is sufficient reason for them to vote for him again. Uh, and 84% predicted Trump would beat Biden. Only 38% said Trump would lose to Biden. And that's a reason to vote against him. That's pretty remarkable, too, I think. It is, but I say game on. Yeah. He, it, it, he's he got a horrible chance. I mean, you've, you, you, the, this red wave that was supposed to happen in midterms, it didn't happen. It only gave the Republicans in the House a slim majority, then, and they've got people bailing off of that majority. So game on. 60% said that they prefer a candidate who does not comment about the January 6th insurrection. But 24% said they support a candidate who supports 
those who entered the Capitol illegally that day. Oh, those people in jail, right? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Trump's Thanks. message of retribution against his enemies is supported by 32% of Republican leaners, even if it's at the expense of getting things done. So there's a third of the people out there, a third of the Republicans out there who like the idea of Trump going after anybody who disagreed with him about anything. Can you imagine living in that echo chamber? It's hard to imagine living in a country where this kind of thing is possible. And it's just, it's disgusting. To me, it's just disgusting that we even have to talk about this guy anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's an we'll, we'll be talking, we'll be talking about him for the rest of uh, the rest of history. There, there's, uh, there's never been anybody like this in American politics that reached this level of prominence and He'll always be he'll always be the subject of some conversation. You know, I have a, yeah, yeah but. I, I agree with that. You know, I have a great picture that I took off the TV of a fly on, on Pence's <laughs> head. It's clear as a bell, that big old fly just sitting there on his gray hair. Anyway, uh, what do you think of Pence's chances? He's not popular enough. He's just, okay. Put him in a lineup with how many other middle-aged to older white Republican men. They're all the same. <laughs> and nobody stands out. The only one that has been able to be more extreme than the rest of them and that is that stupid rain, name recognition that the former president has. I think you, it, might, you might do better than Asa Hutchinson uh, as a nominee, but I don't think he'd do better than Nikki Haley. I, I continue to say that of all the Republicans out there who are running, if she gets a chance, if she gets a chance to win the nomination, I, I think she's dangerous. Uh, I think she's dangerous too. I really do, and she's not lacking for resources either. I saw a right. piece this morning that she's plenty of money rolling in. Game on. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think Pence apparently is. His strategy is is not to use the strategy that Trump used to get to the White House, which is not surprising. He wants to follow a Reaganite path. Yeah, he wants to uh, he wants to come across as a reasonable and good communicator. And of course, he's got he's got experience. He had his radio show before he became governor and uh, of Indiana. So he understands the media, and uh, maybe he can make maybe he can do something with that and following Reagan's footsteps. But uh, I honestly, I, I just don't, I don't see where he gets his support. I don't know what part of the party supports him. He would have the Bush <laughs> Republicans coming back to him. That'd be a, and you've got Kemp here in Georgia catering back to the Bush Republicans. He's not going to denounce anything for these crazy right-wingers, but he's also not going to, he actually is not going to the state Republican convention. Kemp said, I'm out, I'm not going. That's right. Yeah. We haven't talked at all about the Democrats and Biden. Do you guys think there's any chance Biden won't run? No, he, he already said he is. I know he said he is. If he had some catastrophic health issue yeah. uh, that would, that would uh, prevent him from running only because the minute he got sworn in, somebody would invoke the 25th Amendment. And I, I think that... Uh, that could keep him out of the White House for a second term, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I think he continues to march on. When he get, when he first got elected to the Senate, he wasn't old enough to be a senator yet. He was only 29 years old, and, uh, and he, he turned 30 when uh, between the time he got elected and when he got sworn in. So he, he made the age limit, but uh, he's been around for a long time. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. He knows how to he knows how to appeal to the common American, and I think one of the one of the things that's going to come out of this campaign is that, that he's going to cement his relationships with Middle America. I might be a total optimist, but I really believe that because I think he has the ability to do that, and I think he can reach out and he can, by virtue of his background and his upbringing and and his record in the Senate, I think he can reach out to the middle class and, and make great progress in getting Democrats back into the. Uh, back into the good graces of, of the 
American middle class. That's what I'm hoping for out of this election. Hoping that's what he does. Okay. All right, guys. Listen, thanks so much for being with us on the Lean to the Left. By the way, I'm supporting Biden. Can you tell? <laughs> yeah, I am too. <laughs> He's got his pearls again. <laughs> okay, guys. So thanks for being with us. And uh, and we'll be back at you next month with uh, the Dixie Dems on Lean to the Left. Thanks, Bob. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and that you learned something as well. Please come back on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that I hope you find interesting, entertaining, and enlightening. And you can check out the schedule of upcoming shows, guests, and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net. You can also subscribe to our audio version there or to our video shows here at YouTube. And follow us on social media. Facebook at the Lean to the Left podcast, Twitter at Lean to the Left One, Instagram at Bob Gaddy underscore Lean to the Left, and TikTok at, at Lean to the Left. Our goal is to be informative and entertaining as we and our guests comment on the latest developments in the news and about the social issues that concern us all. This is Bob Gaddy signing off for Lean to the Left. Thanks for sharing your time with us.